Well, God bless you. We're in our last session, our, our final session of the final word on the book of Revelation. So it's hard to believe that we're at the end of it. And, and um, as illuminating as it has been, looking at these uh, great uh, sections of God's word, I feel like uh, we're just scratching the surface of all that's contained within this wonderful epistle. So I almost feel like starting all over again. And... Um, I, I'm intending to do that in my study, is to start studying it all over again, because I really feel like I've missed a lot. But there's, it's so rich, there's so much. It's the last book, it's the summary, it's the conclusion, the great conclusion. So, Heavenly Father, we come to you again, and we ask for you to open the eyes of our understanding, to enlighten our eyes, and to fill our hearts with your goodness, and to have the right mind to receive your word as we look into it. Please help us to understand... We love you and we praise you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I was so blessed by Revelation chapter 19, the beginning verses there, the first six verses. I'd like to read them again before we go into the marriage of the Lamb. After these things, <clears throat> I heard someone like a loud, something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because His judgments are true and righteous, for He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and He has avenged the blood of His bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises forever and ever. And then the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. A voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bond slaves, his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like a voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of many peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, Yahweh our God, the Almighty reigns. What a a, a, a great, glorious jubilation, a great a time of praise because it's coming to an end. You know, the whole culmination of all of the ages is being fulfilled and uh, Yahweh is blessed and His, his uh, spirit beings that are with Him are blessed and, and everyone that is going to be in this kingdom is blessed. It's just a really glorious hope that is ours. In the next verses 7 through 10, we have the marriage of the Lamb. Let us rejoice and be glad. And that is really the point of, of all of this as we read through it in this session. It's, it is a time of great rejoicing, knowing in the depth of our hearts and our souls that this is the destiny of the faithful. This is God's destiny and Christ's destiny. This is what's going to happen in the end. Let us rejoice and be glad. Give the glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, These words, these are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In this here we have the imagery of the bride, which has been uh, widespread or is widespread throughout the Bible. We see Israel as Yahweh's bride in, in, in your notes, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, Hosea, really many, many places. Jesus often uses this imagery in the Gospels, in Matthew 22, Matthew 25, Mark 2, John 3, here in Revelation. Again, it's a common uh, analogy or common imagery uh, to communicate to us these great truths that are going to be a reality when Christ comes back. The followers of Christ are the bride 
and they're contrasted in the context to the great whore, the prostitute of Babylon. The whore who was the prostitute of Babylon in contradiction or in contrast to those who are the holy and beautiful bride of Christ. We obviously want to be on the latter end of that uh, description. You know, we want to be a part of the bride. I, I love what Ephesians 5, 25 through 33, it's such a, a great section of Scripture to understand the whole concept of marriage, but, uh, and it gives us marriage as compared with the relationship that we have with Jesus. The church makes herself ready by submitting to the, the lordship of Christ, and that's how the bride makes herself ready for the groom, by submitting to the lordship of Christ, by grace we are cleansed. It's a, it's a gift of grace that we're cleansed and prepared for the marriage. And the marriage imagery represents that perfect union with Him, with full participation in His holiness, in His joy, in His glory, in the kingdom that's to come. Today, with Christ in us, via the Holy Spirit, we are separated from the groom. We still have a, we have a tremendous relationship with Christ because of the Holy Spirit. We have a union that is described in many different ways in the scriptures. This oneness, this sameness, this relationship that is now ours because of the Holy Spirit. But all of us know that as good as that is, it is wanting at times in our life. We, where we, we don't feel that connection or we don't, have faith in that connection, or we don't acknowledge that connection. But then the great day is coming when we will be one, and there will be nothing that separates us from this union, this union of one flesh, as it says in, in, uh, in Ephesians 5.31, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. The husband and, husband and wife relationship, it's a, it's a great mystery. But this, mis this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And when you read that section in Ephesians, it talks about both. It talks about the marriage, and it talks about Christ in relationship to the church. And it gives us a little bit of an understanding of, of the relationship that we have with Him today in the body of Christ because of the Holy Spirit we are, we are one flesh with Him, which means we have one life together with Him. And as I, I just said, however, even as good as that is, there are times in our relationship with Christ where the marriage is on the rocks, where we're not doing well, we've drifted, not that He has a problem, but we have problems, keeping our minds renewed and staying steadfast, and we feel this distance. But in the, in the future, we're going to be that one flesh is going to be a complete reality where everything that impedes our relationship with Christ is completely forever taken out of the way. And we will have total unison and unity with Him forever. Praise the Lord. That's a time of great rejoicing. This is a big part of our hope. And, you know, we've been invited to the, to the wedding. Uh, we've not only been invited to the wedding, We've been invited to be the bride. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great, uh, great understanding. Verse 8, it was given to her, to the bride, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And I, I love this verse of Scripture. It's one that you can truly ponder and great, get great insight from. I think the wording is exact. The bride is given. The bride is give, it's given to her by grace, by the grace of God. But she must also accept that which is given by living righteously. It's given, to, it's given to us, it's all given to us, but we have to take it. We have to, and we have to walk by it, and we have to live by it. Again, I'm reminded of a verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. What we have been made to be in Christ today, with the 
the, the accomplishments of Christ, with the, the new covenant, with the spirit that we've been given, we have now a new life, a new self it's called. We are created, created, brought something new that didn't exist before. We are created in righteousness and holiness of truth or true holiness, holiness of truth. That is the great gift that's given to us with salvation today. That is ours. But you know the verses that follow Ephesians 4.24 is, now that you are created in righteousness and true holiness, live the right way and live holy. Stop lying. Stop stealing. Be kind to each other. You know, don't get angry. You know, and all the things that follow. So there's a, there's a two-part component to the grace that is given that adorns the bride with this beautiful linentry so that she can be a part of the wedding, but she also has to put the dress on, so to speak, and she's got to live the right way. And that's the way I understand this verse 8. Then verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. All the believers from the ages are those who are invited to the supper of the Lamb. I don't think we want to overanalyze this section too much and lose the main point, the point of rejoicing and worshiping Yahweh for the final, for finally the covenants are fulfilled and His dream is realized. More so than ours, His is realized. And the marriage feast of all the things that Israel could relate to as being a time of great rejoicing and celebration, it was the marriage celebration. It was a joyous one. A joyous one in their culture, especially for the bride, obviously, and the groom and the parents. And this, this great, great rejoicing. I don't, I don't take this to be a literal thing of thinking of, you know, it's giving us a, you know, we're not literally a bride and Christ is literally a groom. It's a, it's a, it's a, a metaphor or a, however you want to call it. It's a, a figurative language so that we can grasp the greatness of, of the reality that's going to exist. This oneness of flesh, this connection with Christ and how we're being made holy, how we're invited to this joyous celebration, this joyous time, this gladness and this joy, and it will be ours forever for we will be with our loved one forever. I think of the Song of Solomon, you know, and, and how that is written about a man and a woman, and, and how, how delightful it is that this imagery is brought over so that we can grasp the relationship that we have with Christ and also with Yahweh. And then the, the, the latter part of this, this verse, verse 9, these are true words of God. I, and, and I ponder that. Why does he say that? And then here's what I thought. Here's what I thought. Listen! This is the truth! Hey, hey, hey! Hear what I'm saying! Woo! Like that, Peter? <laughs> He's saying, these are the true words of God. I mean, why does he say that here at the end of the Bible? Isn't everything in the Bible the true words of God? He's just saying, hey, 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 hey! This is the truth. This is what's going to happen. Woo! Wake up to this. Live in light of this. This is your destiny. Evaluate everything in relation to the great promises that are going to come to pass. Live today in light of the great glory that's going to be yours when you participate in the wedding feast of the Lamb. I think that's what that section means <laughs> to me anyhow. These are the true words of God. And then I fell at his feet to worship him. He worshiped the angel. I think, I think uh, John was, you know, he was overjoyed. He was overwhelmed. He was overtaken. He fell at the angel's feet and started to worship the angel. And the angel said, hey, cut that out. Don't do that. That's not what you're supposed to do here. <laughs> But I could see me doing that. I mean, gee whiz. I mean, these things he's telling them. I mean, just, he's so blown over by it, I guess. Don't do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
Angels have many differences from humans. I think that we see that often in the scripture. But they, they, the focus here is not on the differences, it's on the sameness. Angels and disciples are both servants and both worship God. The worship of angels, that this would come up in this revelation, is significant because this was a problem that had developed in Asia Minor, the very place that we're studying where these seven churches were. We bring you thinking back, this is who it was originally sent to, the seven churches. One of them was not Colossians, but Colossians was in the midst of them. Colossians had its own epistle. Remember the Laodiceans connected with the Colossians and so on? Well, in, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Let no one, no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by fleshly mind. I think already at, in Colossae, and if it was in Colossae, it probably was true in, in uh, Laodicea and spreading in this area, is this, this thing of... Uh, worshiping of angels. And here, John is given a, you know, a, vivid, a, a vivid revelation. So much, he was so much impacted by it, he turned and, and started to worship the angel. And hey, we're told right away, don't do that. That's not the way it's supposed to be. We don't worship angels. Uh, now, not everybody has gotten that message. But uh, nonetheless, there it is very, very clear. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was Michael the archangel before he came to earth. And once he came to earth, he was a man. And then once he ascended back up into heaven, he returned to the state of being Michael the archangel. The Mormons uh, receive their revelation from, a, the Mormon, uh, a, from, a, from an angel who gave this revelation to John Smith. The Roman Catholics are notorious for worshiping of idols and saints and angels. And we have it very clear, if you come across this when you're witnessing to somebody, you know, mark this in your Bible. This is a verse that's very clear. Then, actually, it will come up again later on in another chapter. Don't worship angels. Worship Yahweh. Worship God. Now, um, and then it says that the, the, the last part of that verse, uh, verse says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And, and indeed it is, isn't it? All the way from Genesis 3.15, all the way, here we are in Revelation 19, and, it, and the book ends talking about Jesus. The very last verses talk about Jesus. And really, the spirit of the prophecy, or, the, or maybe you, you would say the heart of prophecy, is the prophecy pertaining to Jesus Christ. It's not everything, but it's certainly the spirit of it, the heart of it, because that's where everything is pivotal on that. Before his coming, it's prophecy about his coming. And now that he has come, you know, then there's so much about what he did when he was here, and now it's prophecy about everything we've been studying here is about his coming back, which is, uh, starts to be spoken of in chapter 11. I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. A white horse, I, we've, we've looked at this before. A lot of what we're going to look at in this particular vision that he has here, the vision between 11 and 19, uh, there's a lot of similarities of other things that we've already looked at in Revelation. But the white horse signifies the victor. You know, the white horse is where the, the, uh, the head of the army comes in on the white horse as the victor. He is called here faithful and true. Faithful and true. And uh, he's called that in Revelation, 13, uh, Revelation 3, 14. He's also called that. He is called what he is. He is faithful and true and righteous in his judgments and he wages War. <clears throat> I would really love to take the time to read with you Psalm 96. And if you have a pen, maybe you can underline it in your notes. Uh, you can read that sometime this week as it relates to this subject. Psalm 96, especially verses 8 through 13, it talks about his, uh, 
judging in righteousness, righteous in his judgments, and waging war. Now, so that we don't get confused here, what John is seeing is another picture. He's seeing another vision. Think of a vision as being a picture. And it's, it's, it's not progressive in relationship to the one that we just saw where the, the, uh, the bowls are poured out of wrath. It's not, a, it's not a progressive picture. It's not the same movie. It's another movie on the same subject. Okay, so it's another picture of the same subject. It adds in additional details. It's going to talk about Armageddon again. It's going to talk about that, that war, but it's going to say it a different way. It's going to give you a different viewpoint of it. We've seen it in uh, chapter 18. We got a lot of information on Armageddon. Now we're going to see another vision that God, that God gave to, to uh, John to understand it. You, under, you got what I'm saying? All right, so, so now in verse 12, his eyes are a flame of fire. That sound familiar to you? Remember we saw that very early on in our study in chapter 1, verse 14 and 2, 18. It representing the capacity to perceive and to comprehend with understanding. The fire signifies purity. Fire signifies judgment. I, I, I couldn't help but to think of, when I think of this, of Jesus coming in on this white horse, his eyes are a flame of fire, my mind goes right back to what John the Baptist said about him. He's going to, he's going to come. I'm not worthy to, look, to tie his shoes. He's going to come and baptize you with water, and not with water, with spirit and fire. And this is the baptism of the fire. This is, this is at least one part of that. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diatoms. And his name is written on him, which no one knows except himself. The many diatoms, diatoms are crowns. We saw in chapter 12, verse 3, the red dragon, who is the, the devil, he had diatoms on him. And in chapter 13, verse 1, we saw the beast had ten diatoms on him. Now in the end, Jesus is the one wearing the crowns. That's enough of that. There is not going to be anybody else wearing any more crowns for the enemy. It's, it's God's people now, and Christ is ruling. He's coming in as a victor. And what this is, a, it's, again, there's only eight verses here, but boy, they really are descriptive of the, the conclusive, decisive ending of the wicked and the beginning of the rule of the righteous. Eyes, a flame of fire and on his head many diatoms, and his name was written. He has a name written on him which no one knows except for himself. And again, we saw that early on in chapter 3, verse 12, that Jesus would have a name written on him that no one else would know. As a matter of fact, we're told that we're given names that no one knows besides our, you, know, you and God. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. I think the robe dipped in blood would be his own blood. The victory is through his blood. The robe that he is wearing is dipped in blood. And um, again, a name is called the Word of God. And verse 14, And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were, fo were following him, on white horses. This isn't what we viewed the last time we studied Armageddon. We didn't get the idea that there was an army coming out of heaven. We got the, the idea that there was an army here on earth. Remember, they all came together, they all gathered together in the valley, and like it was in the time of Gideon, they turned on each other, and if there was any army with him, it was, it was Jesus, with Jesus it was the uh, 144,000, and, and it's fair to assume the other that the righteous and faithful ones were with him. We will meet him in the air, and so we will be with him forever. And, you know, that, that we were there, and that, you know, the raised ones were there, and that they would kill each other. But now we see there's a spiritual component to that time, too. That there is, uh, Jesus is riding, it's another vision showing you how this whole thing came to pass. And his mouth comes, verse 15, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may strike down the nations, and he may rule them with a rod of iron. 
Again, the sharp sword, we saw it right in chapter 1, in verse 16. We saw it, I, which one of those churches, I think it was either Pergamum or Thyatira, that he, he appears with the one with the sharp sword? I think it was Pergamum. He, you know, he had the, that's the, the, the religious center. He came with the sharp sword. And then it says that uh, he will strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Now where is that from? Where did we read that terminology before? It's Psalm chapter 2. It's also he that overcomes, one of, the, one of the overcomers will rule with a rod of iron. Again, it's reflecting back to the earlier chapters. And he treads the winepress of the fierce raft of God, the Almighty. We read that in chapter 14, verse 20. It's the same terminology. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now he sees he's got another name. Uh, in chapter 11, I mean, verse 11, he was called Faithful and True. In 12, a name written which no one knows except him. In 13, his name is called the Word of God. In 16, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We like that one, right? He's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which is not the first time he's called that here in the book of Revelation. He's also called that in chapter 17, I think. He's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, the name is the distinctive characteristic of who the person is. This is what, who the person is. And Jesus is that faithful and true one, without a doubt. He is the faithful and true one. He is the Word of God. He is. I mean, He is the Word of God incarnate. He is the Word of God. And He is going to be King of kings and Lord of lords. He is going to rule over all. And all those great prophecies, all those great things that are written throughout the Scriptures are going to come to pass. Jesus is coming back. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in the midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God. The, the mind picture you want to get is, is um, you know, he's looking into the sky. He's seeing the sun. This is not out of space. He's looking into the sky, and, and uh, we, we saw imagery like this earlier, too. And, and he's saying to all the birds that are in the sky, Come on. It's time for you guys to eat. He's not talking to like uh, finches. You know, he's talking to the eagles and to the ravens and to the, you know, all of the carnivorous animals, all the hawks. He's saying, come on in, boys. There's going to be some food for you to eat. <laughs> come assemble for the great supper of God. Now, the great supper of God is not to be mixed up with the supper of the lamb. Okay. The guys that don't get invited to that first supper are going to the second supper. <laughs> actually, the, the, actually, the second supper happens, I think, I'm not sure of the timing of it, but you want to be at the first one. You want to be at the, uh, the Lamb's Supper, the marriage of the Lamb. In verse 18, so that you may eat of the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of the mighty men and flesh of horses and flesh of those on them and the flesh of men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I love the way he does this. You get, the, again, that battle. You got, you got the mighty ones at the battle. You got the kings, the governmental leaders. You got the big shots. The, you know, the rulers of the nations are there. He called in, remember, all the nations come. Dried up the Euphrates. They all come over. All the kings, all the presidents, they all come over. And they got their great commanders with them. All the commanders of the armies are there. That's it, uh, the kings and the commanders. And then the mighty ones, you know, all the, the valiant heroes, all the great warriors of all these great armies, of all through the earth, they're all there. And they're all killed. They're all destroyed. And then their horses and those that sit on them, whether they're slaves or freemen, all the soldiers, everyone is destroyed. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horses against his army. This isn't going to be good for that group. This is not going to be a good, 
a good thing. When you've got the armies coming out of heaven, and heaven, Jesus with the white, this is just not good. Verse 20. Well, it, actually, it's very good. It's great. Verse 20. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in the presence, in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Verse 21, And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Quite a vision, huh? <laughs> yeah. The first two people going into the lake of fire are the false prophet and the beast, the beast and the false prophet. The lake of fire is from, it's talked about again later on in, in the following chapters and subsequent chapters. This is the first time it's really talked about. It was alluded to earlier. We looked at it a little bit. I think it was in chapter 18 or 17. But here, here we see that uh, they are the first two that are thrown in. Then the next time it's spoken of is a thousand years later when we have the resurrection of the unjust. And then that white throne judgment, and then the rest of the evil ones are thrown into the lake of fire after you know, the devil is and, and death and, and uh, the grave. But the first two that are thrown in, so it, it, it just, their first, their first death is also, it seems to me, I might be reading this wrong, but their first death is also their second death, where most everybody, the other guys were killed with the sword. They will be raised a thousand years later, and then they will be judged, and then they will be thrown into the lake of fire. But the beast and the false prophet, they're judged right away. That's it for them. They're thrown into the, to the lake of fire. The next two guys that go in are the guys, at least in short progression thereafter, is, is probably the guy that invented the, the thing where you call on the phone and and you get that automated system. And then the, the guy holding his hand is the guy that did outsourcing. Those two are. OK, that part I made up. That you, you can tell what happened to me the last couple of days. So um, <laughs> oh God, I, uh, And then uh, the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And here is a, another great vision that God gave to, to John that we can read so that we can get perspective and understanding of how this is going to come. And, and it's all coming to an end. All of the wicked is destroyed. All of, all of, all of the evil is, is diminishing. It's going away. It's, gone, it's just leaving. I think of... I think of, uh, of uh, you know, you, you have to have that great demolition. You've got to wipe out the building that's there. You've got to get everything out of there. You've got to get all, all the... Once you knock the building down with the big ball, you've got to get rid of all the parts that are left, and then you start building all over again. And that's exactly what we've been reading. That's what we've been studying. That's how we've seen it with all of the... Uh, the especially with the bowls of wrath that the whole of the earth now, where all the cities of the world, with that great earthquake, not only does the great city of Babylon go down, but all the cities of the world go down. And, you know, then we know that the valleys are raised up, the mountains are lowered, and, you know, there's just this great transformation of the whole surface of the earth. And, and uh, you know, all of this, and then all of the wicked systems, and all of the evil, and all those that are in evil power, and all of this is now in disarray, it's in ruin, so much of the evil ones have been destroyed. And then we come to this great reality of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he lay hold on of the dragon, the serpent of old, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years years. So after, after, we, after the seals, after the trumpets, after the, the bowls of the wrath of God 
After that, all of that has, been trans, has transpired after the, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Then what we see is Satan himself is bound in chains for a thousand years. The devil, the devil was created, was not created evil. Rather, according to Ezekiel 28, he was created beautiful and blameless, the cherub anointed to cover in Eden. He did not become evil until he was in the garden. When he was first in the garden, he was, you read Ezekiel 28, this explains it to you. He was beautiful. He was God's, he was, you know, he was one of God's. He was, a, he was holy. He was right. He was placed in the garden to cover, to guard over it. But he allowed himself to become prideful and jealous of his creator. His fall seems to be simultaneous with the fall of Adam and Eve. For after their sin is when the devil is cursed. He's not cursed before then. There's not consequences that are his before then. It's after then. We know, so there is a beginning point to the devil. He was not created evil. That's not the way he was created. He became evil because his, he was lifted up with pride. He was given free will, as spirit beings are, as human beings are. That he was given free will, self-determination. He became prideful because he was so beautiful. He became, and he was given so much authority. He became prideful. He became jealous of God. And he tried to take the place of God. And that's when evil came into him. And the way that he tried to do this was by stealing Adam and Eve away from God. So I think that a lot of it, if it didn't happen simultaneous, it was pretty dang close. Because right after that is in Genesis 3.14, because you have done this, talking to the devil, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. When people say to you when you're witnessing to them, why did God create the devil? The answer is God did not create the devil. He created a beautiful cherub and gave him free will, and he decided by his own self-determination to do evil. And then you, you, know, you got that whole thing, how fundamental... I mean, you, we have to understand that principle. You have to grab hold of it and not, you have to have that be, if you're going to understand love and faith and, and all that's happened in human history and spiritual history for that matter, if you're going to understand what happened, you've got to understand free will, that God has made that the foundation of love and faith. Man has free will. And angels have free will. And God is not going to violate free will. There is, to the extreme, I mean, God is so committed to that that He allowed the cherub to become the devil. And He allowed Adam and Eve to choose and to fall and to have what we have today because He honors free will. Now, you can judge God and you, can, you, know, you might not like that, but I ain't going to change God. I, I think that it would be wise not to have judgment in relationship to God. What do you think? <laughs> Doesn't sound like a two. But you've got the free will to be that stupid if you want. You really do. You've got free will, and if you want to be that stupid, go right ahead. And I'm sure you would do it. You would have done it much better. Uh, just that kind of reasoning is an indication why you're inept and, and why you, you're not, and we're not qualified to do that. So anyhow, back here again in your notes I was reading to you. So sometime between the fall of man and the flood, that between Genesis 3 and Genesis 6 is where the flood begins to be spoken of, somewhere in between there, he convinces one-third of the angels to join him against Yahweh and Yahweh's purposes of the, of the ages. This is told to us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. The demons were with him before the flood because some of them were locked in chains since that time, according to 2 Peter 2, 4. He deceived Adam and Eve before... So you get my point here? That I, I don't know exactly when he convinced 
these one-third of the angels to go with him. It doesn't tell me. But I know it had to happen before the flood because they were there and involved during the flood. Some of them are locked and chained since that time. I don't think that they were, you know, it didn't happen before he was deceived. So it happened sometime between when he was in the garden and, and, and you know, he decided to do what he did and that time of the flood, which is about 1,500 years. It could have happened simultaneous. I mean, it, it could have happened right after the fall of Adam and Eve. If I want to surmise, he could have said to them, I don't want to surmise. You know, he could have said, well, look what I did to God. And, you know, God maybe isn't so perfect, and maybe you want to join in me. Uh, I don't know how it went down. I don't, he did, doesn't tell me, so I probably don't want to guess, right? Um, so he deceived Eve through his craftiness and strives to do the same with everyone else since, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He's the thief that steals and kills and destroys, according to John 10.10. 10. He deceives... The whole world. I don't think I put that in your note. He deceives the whole world. A Revelation 12, 9. That's an important thing to remember. He deceived the whole world. That includes you. Everybody in the world is deceived. No one is exempt. He deceives the whole world. Revelation 12, 9. And he is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12, 10. He's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works within the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2. 2. He is called our adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is what he is all about, devouring people, according to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He is the one who fights against spirit. He is the one we fight against, spiritual wickedness, in high places, according to Ephesians 6.12. He is the God of this age, which I think means the object, the God of this age, He is the object of worship during this age, in 2 Corinthians 4.4. When it talks about Him being the God of this age, I think that that's, you know, that He is the primary one receiving the worship during this age, uh, indirectly or however it's done. Jesus has already defeated him. He sealed the deal. His destiny is the lake of fire. But as of yet, his sentence has not been carried out. He still functions. According to Colossians 2.15, Jesus defeated him, made a show of him openly, and triumph over him in it. In the end, he will empower the beast. That's that last world leader. He will empower the false prophet, as he has done with many other political and religious leaders throughout the history, throughout the history of humanity, according to Revelation 13. After the seven bowls of God's wrath are poured out, he will be put into the abyss for a thousand years, Revelation 20, where we're reading now, and he will be released for a short time and then cast into the lake of fire where he will be annihilated forever. Now, I would like to add this, that he was wrongly, he is wrongly called Lucifer. Many people call him Lucifer. I would imagine if you looked it up in the, word, the dictionary, that the word Lucifer, it would tell you that it is the devil. But from a, strictly from a biblical point of view, and we, don't, you know, we want to get our truth from the Bible, not the dictionary, that the word Lucifer is used one time in the Bible. It's used in Ezekiel uh, not Ezekiel, it's used in Isaiah 14. And, uh, and, or is it, let me find my notes here. No, he, he, Lucifer is used in Isaiah 14. Okay, Ezekiel 28 is where it explains that he is the devil. You know, that he's the, he became the cherub that covered and became the devil. But in Isaiah 14 is where he's called Lucifer. And if you read Isaiah 14, it's talking about the king of Babylon. And as you, as you read it carefully, it's talking about the king of Babylon past and the king of Babylon future. The king of Babylon in the future is the Antichrist, the beast, the world leader. So when it talks about Lucifer, again, it's used one time in the Bible. One time. And when you read that in Isaiah 14, it's talking about the king of Babylon. He's called the Assyrian. And uh, 
It's not talking about the devil. So we should, that whole thing about calling him Lucifer, and I, I certainly have heard enough teachings about this and the characteristics of light and all of this other nonsense that goes along with it, but it's nice, but it's not talking about him. It's talking about uh, the, his, the guy that he empowers at the end, the beast. So we want to keep it straight. The names are listed here for us so clearly in verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon. The dragon, I'm not sure... Uh, I, I, haven't, I didn't have enough time to do a thorough study of this. It's, uh, a dragon is a large serpent. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know why the differences in terms, dragon, serpent, devil, Satan. That would be a great study. Dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, and Satan. Notice Lucifer's not in that grouping. And he bound him for a thousand years. Well, things, in light of what everything I've just read to you about him, if he's taken out of the way, and I feel it's a fair assumption to assume that his crew is taken with him and they're put in the abyss, we're talking about a different world, <laughs> right? The prince of the power of the air is poofed out. He's not in the air anymore. You know, the adversary he's roaring about as a roaring lion is in a cage, you know. So he, he you know, the spiritual wickedness in high places is in the abyss. He's not in the high places anymore. So we're talking about a whole different world world. And of course, we're already resurrected, mind you. When all this happens, we're already resurrected. We have our new bodies, and you know, we're watching this action. We're not, you know, we're, but he is out of the picture. So now what we have is a whole different existence. And they threw him, verse 3, and he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After those things, he must be released for a short time. There's a thousand year period of time. After you have the, you have the seals, then after the seventh seal opens up to the seventh trumpets, the seven trumpets open up to the seven uh, bowls of the, the you know, bowls or vials of, of the wrath of God. Then you have that, you know, that whole destruction at the end, and then you have the beast and the false prophet are destroyed. That Armageddon thing transpires, they're destroyed. Now the devil is locked in chains, and you know, the whole of the earth is in its ruined state at the beginning of this thousand years. I mean, earthquakes, and is it earthquakes? Is that what it says? Yeah, earthquakes are, the, every city has fallen. I mean, the earth has been shaken. That's how the thousand years begins. Then, at the end of the thousand years is the new Jerusalem comes down. At the end of the thousand years is when we go into Eden. And as John did such a wonderful teaching on this in the uh, Kingdom Covenant class and so, showed how, how it's really a bookend type of thing where you see in the beginning you go from, you go from paradise to the flood and, it's a, and then it's about the same amount of time, a little bit more there, but, and then you go from, the, from the, the judgment of fire to paradise, reverse order. During that thousand year period of time, a lot of good things can get done because the devil is gone. All right? I'm sorry, John. <laughs> I, I didn't even notice you don't have guys on the camera, do you? So... Um, that's going to be a wonderful time. I, I would like to do some more study on this as to why this thousand year period of time is there. It's obvious to me, at least this much is obvious to me, there's a covenant that God made with David about him ruling and uh, what, you know, his descendants ruling. And there's, there's the promise that's made that um, his followers are going to be kings and priests. You don't need kings and priests in paradise. So in order to fulfill these promises, you have this period of time. And I'm sure there's more to it. There's a lot more to it, what takes place during that thousand years. It's interesting that the book of Revelation is pretty well silent on the millennial kingdom, that thousand year period. It doesn't talk much about it. Well, you know, it's talked about a lot of other things that have not been talked about elsewhere in the Bible. But there are many other places in the scriptures talk about um, what happens during that millennial reign. And we'll look at those after we come back from our break.